a brawl link. One of the things that I said last time is that a dictionary definition is merely a definition um, where the makers of dictionaries try to reflect in their definition how people in real situations, people who can handle, in our case, the English language well, how they actually use a word. Um, right? They're not trying to invent a new way of using the word. They're just trying to reflect how educated um, writers actually use it. It's different with what is called a stipulative definition. Um, and you find this a lot in philosophy where a philosopher will take a word and give it a new meaning. And you need to understand that that's what's going on with John Locke and the word idea. He is giving it a new meaning for John Locke and the other British empiricists, an idea is the immediate object that our mind is acquainted with. It's only acquainted with its own inner mental life. Descartes put us there. Descartes put us in what was called the egocentric predicament, where the mind is first acquainted with its own inner mental life. And so for Locke, an idea is the immediate object of perception. Um, remember, Locke is English, right? He's writing in English. So these are his uh, own actual words in, um, I say in essay, but that's short for his essay concerning human understanding, right? So he says, an idea is whatever is the object of the understanding is the part of us that's aware of what's going on, the part of us that perceives. Whatever is the object of the understanding when a man thinks, and here we mean man in the sense, in the generic sense, whenever a human being thinks. Uh, the other definition he gives of ideas is whatever it is which the mind can be employed about in thinking. So this broadens the sense of idea. We usually think of idea as an abstract mental concept. But we'll see in the next slide that for Locke, a lot of other things qualify as ideas. It's whatever our mind is aware of. So for Locke, ideas are any kinds of thoughts or experiences that could be in our minds. The way I uh, have said it before is Locke's word idea includes everything and the kitchen sink. Not everything but the kitchen sink. The, the kitchen sink is an idea for Locke as well. Right? They include whatever we experience or think about. So they can include abstract concepts like the mathematical idea that 2 plus 2 equals 4. But for Locke, sensations that we have also fall under the heading of being ideas. So uh, if this were spring and there were flowers out there, I, it would be something like the smell of spring flowers, the sight of birds. Ideas can also come from inside us, right? You know, when I was young and stupid and 17 and had a motorcycle, I raced Charles Jockel through San Martin Drive and wiped out because he knew it much better. San Martin Drive by Johns Hopkins goes like that. You know, it's a real snaky road. Uh, and I still have some pain in my left shoulder from wiping out on my motorcycle at 17. My Greek professor used to say, youth is the time 
excuse me, when you can make all your mistakes and not have to pay for them now, you know. I pay for them more as I'm getting older, um, you know. So be assured that having a decent level of intelligence does absolutely not insulate you from doing stupid stuff when you're a teenager. <laughs> like, like driving your Honda too fast. So, um, so they can include something that's going on. If I feel a pain in my shoulder, that pain that I'm sensing that's the object, the focus of, of my mind's attention, that also is an idea. Uh, or the feeling that I have of the warmth of the sun. Or uh, a memory impression. If I close my eyes and try to picture my first high school girlfriend, you know, Susie. We're not going to mention her last name. Uh, you know, that memory would also be an idea. Now, now it, the next few slides, we, we get into a lot of picky little distinctions, but they have a profound effect on our claims to have knowledge about anything. And so, you know, we're going to go through them. For, for Locke, then, our ideas come from two sources, from what our five senses tell us about the outside world. So he calls these ideas of sensation. And they'd be ideas of things like colors, yellow or white, of sensations we feel when we touch something, heat or cold, that something's soft or hard, right? Uh, but they also come from reflection. And here we see Locke basically repeating Descartes' I, you know, concepts about what's going on in our minds. In other words, the thought was we could reflect on our own minds and we'd see that our minds are like, for Descartes, um, immaterial little machines where various operations and processes go on, um, you know, like perceiving something. Uh, doubting, believing something, reasoning, knowing, willing, remembering. All of these are internal mental operations. And uh, so we get some ideas also from introspection in our own minds. Now, to go a little further with picky and little distinctions, there are two kinds of ideas. Simple ideas and complex ideas. And the idea, uh, uh, what he's saying is, whatever we have as a complex idea is a conglomeration of simple ideas. So a complex idea is composed of various simple ideas. And so uh, I say, following, we illustrate this distinction um, for for a complex idea that we get from our senses. Consider the idea of an old-fashioned telephone. For Locke, when I look at a red telephone, the idea I have is a complex idea that's composed of the various qualities that, you know, ideas of the various individual simple ideas of the qualities of the telephone. It includes many simple ideas that relate, as I said, to the qualities or properties a telephone has. It's red in color. It has a particular shape. If I touch the telephone, it might feel cool to my hand, and it would, the case of it would feel hard to the touch. Um, the telephone has a particular size. If I picked it up, it would have weight. And if it rang, it would have a sound. So 
my complex idea of that telephone is composed of the various simple ideas I have of the individual properties of the telephone. So let's talk about the properties themselves to dig deeper into these little distinctions. Now, now you may have to review this or, you know, that's one of the reasons, that's one of the advantages of recording this. You can stop the recording. Where, now, now you can stop me and ask a question at any time in class, but, but you know, at home, you can say, well, let, let me stop that and take a note. There are two types of properties or qualities things have for Locke. The ideas we have from our senses, ideas of sensation, are ideas of primary properties or qualities. And we'll see that for Locke, those properties are really in things apart from anybody's perceiving that object. In other words, when you, uh, they, they would include ideas of things like um, the shape of something. Take that rectangular blackboard over there or the rectangular screen. For Locke, when you and I go home this weekend, that Blackboard is still going to have the property of being rectangular. It's not going to change the shape when you and I leave the room, right? It's still going to have the size it has, right? In other words, when we perceive that, we perceive it as having a particular size. Um, but we're going to see that there are different things that he says about the the color of the blackboard and whether it's cool or warm to the touch. So primary properties for him are properties that are really in things and I, and I have a slide coming up with more detail about that. Secondary properties though for him and here's where Locke's view and, and, and really he reflects some of just the science of his day Secondary properties for him are not really in objects as they are in the real world. They're subjective and in us. So what kinds of properties are secondary properties? Well, first of all, they're caused by things like molecular motion. Remember, Locke knows Newton and Boyle, you know, all fellow members of the Royal Society uh, on a first name basis, right? He knows about atoms and molecules. Um, and he knows that the motions of molecules and stuff produce various sensations in us, right? Um, just like you were taught in high school chemistry and physics. Um, but he says there are properties that the ordinary man or woman on the street thinks really are in things that an educated philosopher or scientist knows aren't. They're just subjective and in us. So what does he mean? These he calls secondary properties. And they include things like the colors of something, tastes, smells, Feelings of heat and cold. Take colors, for instance. I mean, the leaves have beautiful colors. I am not colorblind. I, I mean, in the literal, not a metaphorical sense, you know, uh, where it's sometimes used for somebody's views on uh, somebody who... who has a different color skin, but I, I'm not literally colorblind. In other words, when, when I go for a driver's license test this coming March, I'm going to take a little test. I'm going to look through a little lens at the MVA 
and they're going to test whether I'm colorblind or not. And, and there are words embedded in colors, if you've taken the test before, that I can see, but somebody who's colorblind can't see. Right? My dad was colorblind. So presumably, he would not pass that test. He would not see what I see when I look through that lens. And also, when I come up to a traffic light, I see red, yellow, and amber. My dad would not. How does he know whether the light's red or green? How, how does somebody know, if they're colorblind, what color the traffic light is? Pardon? Well, similar, or uh, basically the stop, the red is always, I think, up top. If I, Amber's always in the middle, green's on the bottom. So, so even though he's colorblind, he can tell which light is lit. And he'd say, well, is it the one on top, which means I need to stop, or the one on the bottom, which means I got a green light, you know. Now, this he's to work against us growing up. Um, first of all, my dad's hobby was photography, but he always shot in black and white because it didn't make any difference to him uh, whether he shot in color. Plus, it was easier for him to develop those at home. Um, nowadays, it, it would be very hard for you. First of all, you'd never find a new black and white TV. The only way you'd find a black and white TV is to go to somebody's yard sale or flea market, right, and buy an old one. But when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s, I mean, black, you know, color TVs were very expensive then. A lot of people just had a black and white TV in their home. Now, my dad was the breadwinner. In other words, if we had a TV in our home, it was a TV that he bought, right? Well, to him, it didn't make any difference whether we had color or black and white. So we never did get a color television set at home when I was growing up. The only way my parents came to have a color set was when my brother and sister-in-law got married and bought them one for Christmas because they were both making some money at the time. Um, so what, what am I trying to say? Well, the idea is the subjective experience my dad has when he pulls up to a traffic light or looks through that MVA of test for colorblindness is presumably different from the one I would have. Um, so colors for him are subjective. Tastes and smells, right? I am so negatively affected by even the smell, much less the taste of a green bell pepper, yeah. that my mother had a dish she made um, stuffed peppers, where you stuff it with a mixture of, of spices and rice and ground beef and stuff. I could not even go in the house when she was making that. I mean, the smell of green peppers was so, you know, negative to me. And yet, I had a housemate in graduate school when a bunch of us shared a house whose idea of a snack was a toasted English muffin, cottage cheese, and half of a green bell pepper. That would not have been my idea, right? Um, feelings of heat and cold. Now, here's uh, an argument Locke makes to try to convince you that heat and cold are not really properties in the water, but are in us. Now, when I was a kid out in front of the house, and, and the hill is still there, because I'm living in the house I grew up in, I inherited it. It's one thing that enables me to do this. My overhead is low. Otherwise, I'd be out there in the real world with 
my real job, you know, managing somebody's store or something. Anyway, um, when I was a kid, um, it, when we'd get a few inches of snow, there was a hill on a lot out in front of the house that we'd, we'd be able to sled down. Now, my parents always bought us these little thin, you know, kind of knitted gloves that you'd buy at the five and ten cent store that would get wet and they really didn't keep out the cold very well at all, especially if you were sledding and they got wet. So I'd come in, like she'd call us in from dinner, and my, um, my hands would be really cold. We had separate hot and cold, and it was just easier to reach the cold water spigot. So I'd turn on the cold water spigot, put my cold hands under it to wash up for supper, and the cold water would feel warm because my hands were so cold. And that's the kind of thing Locke's talking about here. I mean, suppose you were facing us, right? And there's hot water here, kind of room temperature or lukewarm, tepid water here, and cold water. In other words, this isn't so hot that you can't put your hand in it, but it's hot water, like maybe hot bath water. This is, uh, say, water that's cold, maybe even has some ice in it. But you can leave your hand in it for a while. Well, suppose you put your right hand in this one, your left hand in this one, and you let them there for a few minutes so they got, you know, adjusted. Now, suppose you took your right hand out of the hot water and you put it in the room temperature, or lukewarm water. How would this water feel? Yeah, it would feel cold, right? Um, you know, because you just had it in really hot water, so this feels cold to your right hand. Now suppose you took your left hand out of the ice water and you put it in here like I did when I came in from sledding and had cold hands. How's this going to feel? Warm. It's going to feel warm, right? And you say, well, wait a second. The very same water can't be warm and cold at the same time. So how do we get out of the contradiction? We say, you know what? Heat and cold are not really properties of the water. They're just subjective and in us. And that's the, what Locke argues for all these secondary properties. So... Um, so I, I describe the experiment, you know, then when both hands are then placed in tepid water, the right hand feels cold, the left hand feels warm. We must either conclude that the same water is both hot and cold at the same time or conclude that heat and cold are not in the water itself as properties but are mind dependent and in us. Now, if somebody's music is so loud that I can hear it here, it's too loud. Guy? Oh. <sighs> well, all right. If, if, if that's really bothering somebody, you can nudge him. <laughs> okay. It, 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 it's loud. Okay. Go back to Hope that'll help you on test too in a week. So, but for Locke, what he calls primary qualities really are in things. In other words, the color of that blackboard for him is subjective and in us. In order for a color to exist, it has to be perceived by somebody. But he says things like size, shape, molecular texture, the ability to move in space, all are genuinely in objects. Now, here's the thing. <coughs> the, 
the mind is never, for Locke, directly acquainted with the outside world. How does it gain any knowledge of things in the outside world if the only thing it knows are its own inner ideas? Well, think about it. Uh, Has any of us ever been in the presence of the president, ever see him directly? Okay. Nobody. But yet, if I ask any one of you, well, do you know what President Obama looks like? Every one of you would say yes. And so would I. Why? Because we've seen representative images of the president. I had some time in the afternoon between my morning and evening classes to catch a little of the um, Benghazi hearings. Well, when I'm looking around for it and I see a person up on the screen, I recognize her as Hillary Clinton. Why? Because I've seen images of her. Um, What Locke's view is, is our ideas of primary qualities really resemble them. In other words, when you and I look at that blackboard over there, the idea we have of a rectangular blackboard, even though that's what we immediately experience and not the blackboard directly, now, if you're saying, that's not what I believe, I, I believe we see the blackboard directly. Yes, and so do most other ordinary people. But the view of these people is, yes, but, but a little real science and real philosophy is going to convince you that you never do perceive things in the external world directly, but only your inner sensations. There's no causation at a distance. Right, so they thought their view was the scientific and educated view. The uneducated man or woman on the street thinks we see the blackboard directly and not an internal representative image of it. But pity that poor person, they just don't understand. If they had a little science or philosophy. Now, now see, I, I'm, I'm being a little cynical here because um, I believe that the Scottish philosopher Thomas Reed, who followed the British empiricists and who argued against him that, yes, we really do perceive things directly, I believe he's right and they're wrong. But this is Locke's view of how we gain knowledge about the world. We have representative inner images of things, but they accurately represent, especially by resembling them, um, you know, things in the real world. So we have an inner representation of a rectangular blackboard but it really represents a real rectangular blackboard. Now, I, I, I know you may think, well, what's this got to do with my life? You know, how did this affect anything in philosophy? Well, it affected things profoundly. Because what we're going to see is, if you hold that we never have any direct experience of things in an external world, but only of our own minds, our own inner ideas or sensations, it becomes very hard in a rational way to justify the claim that we have any knowledge of stuff in the real world. And, and so these views ultimately led to skepticism and cynicism about our knowledge of things. As Thomas Reed put it, ideas were introduced by philosophers 
to explain how we perceive things in the external world. And as we're going to see through um, Barclay and ultimately Hume, they tended to take over. And, and, and in the end, the only thing Hume can justify is the existence of his inner perceptions, which is what Locke called ideas. So, um, what is a material object like a telephone for us? Well, for Locke, it's just the combination of its primary and secondary properties or qualities. But again, not all those properties are really in the telephone. For Locke, the red color of the telephone is not really in the telephone as a property, but is subjective and in us. In other words, if I or you, if you're not colorblind, look at that slide of the red telephone, you see the bright red object, right? But if my dad, who was colorblind, looked at it, he wouldn't have the same subjective experience. So Locke says, well, doesn't things like colorblindness show you that color is just subjective and in us? It's not a property in things. So for Locke, the red color of the telephone isn't really in it. It is produced in our minds when we look at it by the causation, the motion of its molecules as they, uh, you know, are reflected in the light off the telephone and hit our eyes, da-da-da-da-da-da, right? But he says the size and the shape of the telephone really are properties in the telephone. In other words, when we go home over the weekend for Locke, that blackboard is going to retain its size and shape. All these desks are going to be existing here with the proper primary properties of weight, size, hardness, the shape they have. Those things aren't going to change, right? In other words, when all the perceiving minds leave the room those primary properties are, are going to stay. So Locke is what we call a realist. He believes that there's a real external world just like we believe there is, populated with objects that are going to be there in the world whether anybody perceives them or not. And so, but this is where we're going to go next time. I, I'm going to kind of keep you uh, with the other class. But for Locke, then there's a difference between the world as we perceive it or experience it and the world as it actually is. Um, and we're going to see Locke's view separates us from the real world. We do not perceive the world as it really is. We perceive a world where we think objects have both primary and secondary properties. But for him, the real world has only primary properties. This view is called indirect realism. It's realism because Locke thinks there's a real material world that exists whether we perceive it or not. These chairs are not, and desks are not going to go out of existence this weekend when you and I aren't here. Um, but it's called indirect realism because, again, his view is what the mind directly experiences is only its own ideas, its own, uh, own, own inner sensations, and they represent the external world, but we never perceive the external world directly. Now, we're going to see next time that this leads to a very skeptical position. 
regarding the existence of things. So, okay. Well, look. Have a, a great weekend. Uh, a, as I told people, if you missed it, the test is a week from Monday. But I'm going to try to at least get the essay questions up on Blackboard later this afternoon. And I may be able to get the review sheet up there as well. Um, so uh, remember to pick up a Scantron um, if you don't already have one for the test a week from Monday. So take care. Have a great weekend. Uh, catch the roll if you haven't.